In April 2025, I went to MIT and asked conceptual physics questions to the students and graduate students. This video contains two conceptual physics questions along with the impromptu answers from the students. Question 1. In the famous double slit experiment, what happens to the interference pattern if you observe which slit the particle passes through? I'm Haley. Uh, are you a student here? Yeah, I am. What do you study? I study AI. Okay, and what year are you? I'm a senior. Do you know the double slit experiment? Yes, I think so. Where, like, they put... They shone light through like slits and then it showed patterns like diffraction patterns on the wall. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think it was it was just there to show like interference and and destruction destructive interference. Okay, um, that's like really all I remember. Luke, and what year are you? A junior. Okay, what do you study? Math and physics. Oh, perfect. So the double slit experiment, um, it concerned an apparatus where you had an extremely dim light bulb that would basically was so dim that it would emit only one photon at a time, one little, basically one little particle of light at a time, and you had this sort of a card where there were two slits that the particle could go through. So if you had only one slit, the, part, the photon would just sort of spread out like normal and nothing interesting would happen. So if you had two slits, you would think that you would also just get the one or the other, but instead what happens is that the particle sort of interferes with itself Perfect. and sort of cancels out. The, and you have, have this pattern of alternating like regions where there's more or less light observance. And this was considered evidence that light should have the nature of a wave instead of just being a particle. But if you observe it, then you can't get the cancellation out anymore when one of the states gets observed and the other one doesn't. So it just, the interference pattern would go away. I'm Manu. I'm a graduate student. Oh yeah, which year are you? I'm in my third year. Okay, what do you, what, what field? Uh, I do quantum gravity, algebraic quantum field theory, more theoretical physics. Okay. You should think of it as um, the Heisenberg uncertainty relation, where the statement is that you can either know the position of the particle very well or the momentum. And if you know exactly which slit it went through, then you know the position extremely well, but then you don't, you have no clue about the momentum. The wave-like property vanishes, and then once the wave-like property vanishes, it's, uh, you don't get interference. Uh, why does the interference pattern vanish as soon as you know exactly what slit the electron went through or because you've measured it you know that it is in one particular state and there's no wave-like property and interference is a wave-like properties like uh, it's the feature of a wave-like property and so because that wave-like property has now vanished you don't see any interference pattern it's almost like a particle going through so so you're saying initially it's located at both of the slits simultaneously, simultaneously yeah it's, its location is not at one slit but it's at two two slits. yeah yeah so so as your superposition. superposition yeah exactly yeah. that's the and, then, and then when you make a measurement all of a sudden you localize it to one, one slit, slit whichever yeah. slit you measure, measure exactly you and 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 this is like a big open problem that i think people still don't understand of which is called the measurement problem like how what makes the electron be in the beginning be in the superposition of these two different locations and then suddenly when you measure it it becomes localized at one position mm -hmm. so it's the statement that the words that are used usually are the wave function collapses to one of the states so the, so the mechanism of how yeah. it collapses is that's it, what science is missing yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's it's still yeah I it's know. a big, a big, it's a big <laughs> okay thank you thank double you. slit experiment consists of an electron gun a double slit and an observing screen. The electron gun fires electrons one at a time towards the double slit barrier. Each electron passes through both slits simultaneously because it behaves like a wave, not a particle. Without observation, each electron behaves like a wave and interferes with itself, producing a wave interference pattern on the screen. This is the wave interference pattern. The majority of the electrons would be detected in between the two slits in the central maxima. Then there'd be a dark spot where no electrons would ever be detected and then you have a bright spot where electrons will be detected, and so on. This is the wave interference pattern. If we try to detect which slit the electron goes through, the interference pattern disappears, and we observe a particle-like pattern. With observation, there's just two bright spots, and these bright spots are in line with the two slits. Detecting the path destroys the pattern. Placing a detector at one of the slits collapses the electron's wave function and destroys the interference pattern. If you learn which slit the electron goes through, its wave function collapses, and the interference pattern disappears. Question two, explain the difference between covalent, ionic, and metallic bonds. 
On this slide, I'll discuss what a covalent bond is. Imagine two atoms, each with one valence S electron. Their atomic wave functions can combine by adding or subtracting, and both combinations still solve the Schrodinger equation. Adding the wave functions forms a bonding orbital. In a bonding orbital, the electron probability is highest between the two positive nuclei, holding them together like an adhesive. This is what a covalent bond is. Subtracting the two wave functions creates an antibonding orbital with a node in the middle, a region of zero probability. This raises the energy and does not promote bonding. Electrons are fermions, so the total wave function must be anti-symmetric. Because the two electrons have opposite spins, this bonding orbital is still allowed to exist. If more electrons were added and filled the antibonding orbital, the bond would be canceled and the molecule would not form. Only shared valence electrons change wave functions and form new molecular orbitals. Bonding orbitals stabilize the molecule and form the basis of covalent bonds. Now let's discuss ionic bonds. Ionic bonds form when a metal donates one or more electrons to a nonmetal. This creates oppositely charged ions. The electrostatic attraction between these oppositely charged ions holds them together. In an ionic bond, an electron leaves one orbital and jumps to another orbital. And then because of a charge difference, the two atoms are attracted together. That's how an ionic bond works. And finally, a metallic bond is the electrostatic attraction between positively charged metal ions and a sea of delocalized, free-moving electrons. In metals, outer electrons become delocalized and move freely throughout the entire structure. Unlike covalent or ionic bonds, metal bonding is not between specific pairs of atoms. Metallic bonding is a collective phenomenon. It involves many metal atoms, not just two. Two isolated metal atoms do not form a stable metallic molecule. Covalent bonds share electrons, I think, from what I remember, and then metallic bonds, I think they literally just strip electrons from each other. Okay. Um, and then, oh wait, no, that's ionic. And metallic, they're just all together, just... Perfect! I think with electrons. And in, so ionic bonds are when the electrons are actually exchanged between, like if you have a, a say one of, one example of ionic bond would be like HCl, where uh, you would have the H becoming H plus by losing an electron, the chlorine becoming a Cl minus, where so they are much more polarized and the electrons are actually exchanged. Whereas in covalent bonds, it's more sharing of electrons. And uh, and what was the third? Metallic. One? Metallic bond. Yeah, I don't know what the exact definition of that is. In a covalent bond, you can picture there is, for example just say in like a two atom molecule, there could be an electron uh, in some state that surrounds both nuclei, like both atoms, and that's sort of somehow what keeps it together. Whereas in the case of an ionic bond, we might expect like one electron is basically completely donated from one atom to the other, uh, such that it's almost like they're sort of discrete objects, like all of the electrons are either in one atom or the other, but because then one is negatively charged and one is positively charged, that's what ultimately pulls them together and sort of keeps them cohesive in some way. And then a metallic bond, I guess, uh, I don't know if I've ever heard the exact terminology metallic bond, but at least in a metal more generally, we might expect the electrons are totally delocalized, or at least some electrons are totally delocalized. They're spread throughout the whole metal. Um, and there's sort of this, uh, it's almost, we can think of like all the positive charges blending together and all the negative charges blending together and it all sort of holds each other in place. Acephysics.org, math and physics tutoring with Dr. Hudis.